Consistency separates winners from wannabes. Diligence makes the difference between all-time greats and one-hit wonders. For the race is not given to the swift or to the strong, but to the one who endures to the end. So pick yourself up, shake your past off, put one foot in front of the other end, do it again. When you hear the voice that tells you you don't have what it takes, shake it off, it's a lie, put your foot down, take back your place. Let the voice of the giants of faith who surround you, the echo of those who made way long before you, the voice of his spirit whose strength is inside you, drown out the distraction and chaos around you. Stand firm, run hard the race set before you. Take hold, lift high his promise assured you. And when you're down, don't quit, there's still fight left in you. We're surrounded, men of faith who've learned the art of perseverance. We're surrounded, women of courage who know what it means to face their fear and how it feels to get knocked down, but to now hold their crown of victory. So let's run this race until this race is done. Let's run this race until this race is won. We're running with giants. Good to see everybody again. My name is Jason Lee, pastor here. We're uh, awesome. It was so cool. Yesterday, we had a serve day here at our church and where we had about 75 people take a Saturday and they just came. We blessed our community like crazy. Come on, you give it up for them. They were out here. They, they had weeds to pull in their own yard, but they were here at the church pulling some weeds. And so we were able to bless a bunch of different nonprofits in our area. We made lunches for the police and firefighters of our Rochester Hills here in Rochester. And we uh, did some other great things and it was so amazing to see. And if you notice, we got some brand new mulch out on the, all the school islands out here. We kind of spruced up the school a little bit just to be a blessing to our location here. Because we want to be a church that somebody said to me a long time ago, if your church cease to exist in your community, would your community ever notice or even care? And so I took that to heart and I said, listen, we're gonna be a church that's in the, the fabric of our community. We love Rochester Hills, we love Rochester, we love Oakland County, we love that God has placed us here and, and we wanna just be a part of what God's already doing here and, and be here for the people of the city and just be a blessing and not a curse in Jesus' name. So good things are happening. So we're, we do this every year. So if you didn't get a chance to do it this year, you sign up next year, you get a free t-shirt in Jesus' name. So if anything, that's good. Amen? All right. Well, good to see everybody again. We're in week three of an awesome series that we're doing in here called Running with Giants. Running with Giants. And, and I don't know about you, but maybe there's been times in my life where I've kind of walked through some difficult seasons, some difficult situations in my life. And I've asked the question at times, Am I the only one going through this? I don't know if you've ever felt that way or maybe you're going through a difficult time and it's easy to think, am I the only one who's experiencing this? Am I the only one who's feeling this way? You know, you can roll up into church on a Sunday morning and everyone looks like they got, they look like they got it all together. They got, they're dressed up, they're looking good. But then as you come into a church service, you know what you're going through. You know what's happening in your life. And even though everyone around you looks like things are perfect, things are great, there's sometimes there's moments of your life when you're thinking, am I the only one thinking this? Am I the only one struggling with this? Am I the only one questioning my faith? Am I the only one walking through a difficult season right now? Everybody else seems to be smiling, but I'm struggling on the inside. If you've ever gone through that, man, this series is for you. Uh, this series is all about looking at some of the great, amazing heroes of the faith. People that have gone on before us, that the Bible has written about and talked about, that we can now look back at them and kind of say, okay, what did God do in their life? What can we take a hold of today and really grasp? I love our theme verse for this whole series is in Hebrews chapter 12. 
Starting in verse one, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Let me stop right there. I love it because the scripture says that these people, these giants of faith, these people that maybe you've heard about, you've, you've read about at certain times, even if you haven't grown up in church, maybe there's some biblical characters that you've heard about. But the Bible says that these characters now, these people who are just like you and me, are now up in heaven cheering you and me on every single day. I mean, they got their pom-poms going, that your name is written on their chest. Come on, somebody. I mean, they are like fanatics for you. And they are cheering you on, they're cheering me on every day saying, listen, God was faithful for me, he showed up for me, he did some amazing things in my life, it didn't look like it was gonna work out, but God God did work it out, and now here I am in heaven cheering you and I on, saying, hey, you can do this. You can finish this race. You can do the things that God's called you to do. You don't have to be worried about these things. God's faithful. He'll be there for you. And so Hebrews 12 is kind of what a lot of people call the, the hall of fame of faith, or Hebrews, actually the, the chapter before it, Hebrews 11 is the, the hall of fame of faith, where, where it lists off all of these great giants of faith, it's these men and women who have done some amazing things for God. And, and it's interesting because in this little hall of fame, uh, there, there may be a line or two lines about somebody's life. And, it, and it, like their whole entire life, you know, is wrapped up into a couple little lines. And I was thinking about that, this, this whole series, and I'm like, wow, if my life was, was summed up in just a few lines, if my, my entirety of my contribution to the earth and to the people around me was summed up in a few lines, what, what in the world would it say? What would people write about me? And then I started thinking about you and our church and thinking, well, what would, what would people write about us? What would people write about City Light? What would people write about you? If your life could be summed up in just a few different lines, what would people say about it? And then I was thinking about, you know, what would, what are the lines that maybe would not get written about my life because I let fear or I let comfort hold me back to the things that God really is calling me to do? What are the lines that could have been written about you, but we let fear and we let setbacks and we let the things of this earth kind of keep us from the destiny that God has for us? What are those things that kind of keep us back and what can we, what risks do we need to take at times? What things we need to go after and say, I believe God is with me and he can do it. What are the lines that could have been written, but if we just said, I'm gonna go for it. I have the faith to trust God in these moments. What are those lines could it be? I thought this, I saw this quote and it, I thought it was so good. I may print it out and put it all over my wall one day, but this was so good. It said this, it said, make sure that the habits you have today are in alignment with the dreams and goals you have for tomorrow. I thought that was so good. I'm gonna read that again because it was so good. And I only got one little good amen there. So make sure that the habits you have today are in alignment with the dreams and the goals you have for tomorrow. I thought that's so good. I think it's so good. And I want you to know that in, in, in this whole scripture, everything that we're talking about is that, listen, that, that, that there's heroes of faith that are cheering us on, that you're not alone in this world. You're not alone in your race. You're not alone in your difficult season. But that, that the habits that we're kind of talking about and the perseverance that we're kind of talking about through the series that we can establish in our life today, we can establish in our walk today, can make a difference for the dreams and the destinies that God has for us. So going back to that verse, it says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. It's kind of funny, every morning when I get up for work and I get going and I get in my car and I start to drive out of my neighborhood to get to the main roads, it's so funny because almost every morning I see this guy who's running in my neighborhood almost every morning. It's like we must be on the same time clock or something. We have the same thing, but, but he's out there running every single morning. And I drive by him and, and I kind of get angry a little bit inside because he's out there, his shirt's off. He's all cut, he's got his abs and pectoral. He's wearing those runner shorts that's just a little bit too short. You know what I'm talking about, somebody? Okay, and so he's out there running and he's doing it. His sweat is glistening off his body and I'm looking at him and I'm like, you know, I got my coffee and my bagel and I'm like looking at him and he's doing it. He's out there running and I'm sitting here and I'm like, oh my gosh. And I don't know whether to run him off the road or just cheer him on, you know, I don't know what to do. So I roll down my window every morning and I'm like, you're doing it. 
And then I just vroom, drive right by him. He probably hates me. He's looking for my car. Uh, but it's interesting because this dude, he is out there running all the time. And, and even in the winter, I see him out there. Like he's got his snow booties on and all bundled up and his runner tight spandex. And he's out there doing it in the middle of the winter time too. And, and I want to say to him, man, you're making it look way too easy, dude. I mean, like you're out there doing this. And it's like you're making it look way too easy. But what I think about this is that he's learned something that I need to learn. And that I think a lot of us need to learn just in life in general general is that he said he's saying and I don't know this guy I'm just assuming but he's saying I'm gonna get up and get out there no matter what I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna let the alarm clock go off and I'm not gonna hit the snooze button today I'm gonna get up there no matter what I'm gonna get out there on the street I'm gonna get out there doing the thing that I know I need to do I need to push through the pain I need to push through the difficult time I need to push through the seasons when I don't feel like it I need to push through the moments when I don't feel good inside but I'm gonna do it anyway and I think there's something to be learned there that there's so many times in life, and the Bible talks about it, that sometimes there's gonna be things that wanna trip us up, entangle us, slow us down from the destiny and the dreams that God has over your life. And I think we gotta learn at times is there's gonna be moments of life where mountains are gonna come, situations are gonna come, difficulties are gonna come, but we've gotta learn to push through those situations. We gotta learn to push through the difficult seasons and keep showing up even when it's hard, keep showing up even when it's difficult, showing up even when it's 30 degrees below outside and you don't want to run that morning, but it's like, hey, I'm going to show up. I'm going to, I'm going to live for God. I'm going to do the things that God's called me to do, even when it might be difficult. I think the key to this whole thing in the Bible is saying, listen, I know it's going to be hard. I know life's not going to be easy, but you got a cheering section in heaven who is saying, I believe in you. You can do this thing. And how you do it in verse two, it says, by fixing your eyes on Jesus. That's so good. The pioneer and perfecter of our faith. I love that because there's so many times in our life that we have our own plans. We have our own desires. We have our own pathways that we want to take. But I truly believe that God has a plan for every single one of you in this room today. He's got a destiny over your life. He wants to do something inside of you. And then when you begin to fix your eyes on Jesus in the midst of the tough times, in the midst of the moments that are trying to entangle you, when you fix your eyes on Jesus, you can begin to embrace the God who, when Jeremiah 1 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. God says that about you. He, before you were even in your mama's belly, he goes, I knew you, I set you apart, I formed you. I set you apart for great things. And then Jeremiah 29, 11, a great verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That's the God that we're serving. That's the God we're talking about. So I don't like it when anybody thinks that their, that their life is just ordinary and they can't do anything for God and God doesn't have a destiny or calling on their life. It's like, no, 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 no. If you look at the word of God, he's got great plans for you. He's got great things in stores for you. He wants to do great things through you. But you gotta push through the difficult seasons of life. And in Hebrews 12, three, it says, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Because it's easy to grow weary and lose heart at times in life. But by fixing your eyes on Jesus, we begin to see what God is calling us to see. And these people of faith are cheering you and I on. Saying, if God did it for me, I'm a nobody. He can do it for you. And so in this series, we've kind of been asking some of these giants in the faith to kind of, as they're in the stands now cheering us on, we're in the game. We're asking them to kind of come down out of the stands and, and maybe run a lap with us a little bit and, and kind of listen to their story and, and learn a little bit more about what God did for them and, and how we can take some things from their story and apply it to our life. And, and if God did it for them, he can do it for us and what would they say? What advice might they give us? What can we count on that? What, what did God do for them? And Because the same God, is, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's the great thing about our God. So today we're kind of grabbing a, an older guy that, you know, that we've heard some stories about him. And if you grew up in church, you know his story a little bit. Or even if you didn't grow up in the church, you might know a little bit about a man named Noah. Noah. Noah's Ark, Noah and the Flood, all the great, the two by two animals getting on the boat. You know, they made a move, a couple movies about them as well. And so it's interesting because I think there's a lot that we can learn from the life 
of Noah. And I think his overarching theme of his life, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. And that is one person can make a world of difference. If you look at Noah's life, you look at what he did and what God did through him, one person can make a world of difference. Now you may be sitting there today and you may be thinking, you know, I, I'm just a mom, I'm just a dad, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just a, an architect, I'm just a doctor, I'm just a college student, I'm just a high school student, I'm just whatever. We can all come to a conclusion of our life and we can think that I'm just this. You know, I, I can't make a world of a difference because I, I, I'm not influential, I don't have a great business, I don't have this. There's a lot of excuses that we can all have from time to time and say, you know what, you know what, maybe that's for pastors or leaders or certain temperaments or driven personalities, but I I really can't make a difference. But I think if Noah was in this room today and he sat down with you and had a cup of coffee, I think he would look you in the eyes and say, not only do I believe that one person can make a world of difference, but I believe that one person is you. I believe Noah would say that to every single one of us today and say, it doesn't matter what you think you don't have. It doesn't matter what you think your insecurities might be. Because one person can make a world of difference. And I, I really believe that one person is you. And so Noah's life is kind of a, a great story. And, and to kind of understand Noah a little bit, I wanted to give you just a little bit of, of background about Noah's story because it's kind of interesting to read about these things. Now, if you're new to church, new to the Bible, if you grab your Bible and you open it up on, on a Sunday or whenever you have it, the Bible doesn't necessarily always read chronologically, meaning it doesn't always go in order. Sometimes the, the books of the Bible were grouped in certain type of categories. So there's a historical category. There is a prophetic category. There's a poetic category. There's the Gospels in the New Testament. There's the prophets' writings. So there, sometimes the books of the Bible are grouped together. So if you read it from cover to cover, it doesn't necessarily read that way. But I want to focus on the historical part of the Bible. I tell people all the time that I believe the Word of God is the greatest historical document that we have today. I mean, there is about 6,000 biblical years recorded here in the Word of God. And so Noah's story kind of comes about a thousand years after Adam and Eve. So if you know that story, the first two people that God created, his story comes about a thousand years after that. He comes about, um, about 3,000 years before Jesus comes. And so about a thousand years after Adam and Eve, Adam, Noah's here on the earth, and he lives at a weird time in, in, in society where the people of the earth are actually abandoning God. They, they're walking away from God. They're, they have nothing, they don't want anything to do with God. And he's seeing this tension rising in his land. He's seeing it. Now, one of the weird things about Noah that sometimes people get stuck on is that the Bible says that Noah lived to be 950 years old. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live that long. I think I'm just good at whatever God has for me, but 950, that's great. And the, the Bible says, is that he was 500 years old when he started having kids. I mean, I think he's probably lived the, him and his wife probably lived the bachelor, the newlywed life for a while. And then, all right, we're 500 now, let's start having kids, I guess. And so for some people, that's a sticking point for them when they read the Bible. For some reason, the Bible talks about that before the flood, people lived a lot longer than they do today. But after the flood, we start seeing the kind of the lifespans that we see now today, 120 years at the max. And so a lot of people get stuck on that. But I love what Andy Stanley, a preacher, said. He said, I love what he said. He goes, when you pick and choose what you believe in God's word, your faith is less in God and more in you. I think that's so true. We, when we pick and choose, I don't know if I believe that, do I believe, we're, we're putting our faith really in our own mind, in our own understanding, in our own ability to grasp some things, and, and you take out of the realm the supernatural of a God who created everything. And so I'll sum it up for you. If, you. if that's a sticking point for you, I'll give you my answer. This, you can write this down. Why did people live a lot longer back then? Here it is. You guys ready? Gluten. They didn't have gluten back then. <laughs> no gluten. They ate all organic. Okay, they had Whole Foods, it was great. And so that, that's why they lived a lot longer. So, but anyway, let me get back to the scripture. Genesis six, it says this. It says, now the Lord, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Now I want you to catch this next verse. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart 
was deeply troubled. There's another translation that says that God was grieved that the part that, 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 that every human that was on the earth, except for Noah and his family, that all it was was evil all the time. Another translation said his heart was filled with pain because of this moment. And in verse seven, it says, so the Lord said, I will wipe the face of the earth of the human race that I've created. And I know that sometimes when we read things like that in, in scripture and we read things in the church, it's like, well, that doesn't sound like a loving God. What's going on here? I don't get that part. That sounds pretty old school vengeance God. I don't know about this. You know, I don't get that. And one of the things that I, I began to look at this and begin to really realize is I have no idea what it must be like to be God, and especially back then, to see only evil all the time. Like God saw only evil all the time. When you and I get out, turn on the evening news, you turn on CNN, Fox News, or Channel 7, whatever your thing is, you turn that on, it's easy to see the shootings and the, the, the depravity of humanity and all the things going on in the world. And, and it's like, wow, there's so much negative stuff going on. You turn on your, your Facebook and you see the timelines of different things happening in our world and videos of, of shootings and you name it, things happening in the world. It's so hard for us sometimes to see that. We're like, oh, gripped by the crazy injustices that are happening in humanity. And, but the thing that you and I can do that God can never do is we can turn the channel. We can close our laptops or we can go on YouTube and watch a cat video to make us feel better, you know, and, and do something like that. We can, we can change the channel. But God can never change the channel. He sees everything all the time. He sees every act of abuse. He sees every act of injustice. He sees everything that was betrayal and, and all the evil that is in our world. He, see, he can never turn his eye to it. He sees it all the time. I can't imagine what it must have been like and what it is like that for God. And then in verse eight, it says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. I think that's a very, very important part of this whole story is that even in the midst of the craziness of the culture that Noah lived in, even in the midst of only evil, only all the time, that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord and God was going to make an impact. He was gonna preserve his covenant and his promise through one man and through one family. And so one of the things I began to see in this is that Noah began to make a difference, not only in his world, but in, in the worlds to come, in the generations to come. So if you're taking notes, how can you and I make a difference? What can we learn from Noah this morning that we can really take with us as we leave here today? Number one, if you're taking notes, I think that we can learn from Noah's life is this, that you can make a difference in your family that you can make a difference in your family. Genesis 7, 1 says this, I love this. The Lord then said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found, I have found you righteous in this generation. He didn't say because I found your whole family righteous. He said because I found you righteous, Noah. See, I just think there's a great thing here to begin to take is that because of Noah stood firm in the midst of the crazy culture, because Noah kept seeking God even in the midst of the craziness of people all around him, he stood firm in this whole thing. And because of that, his whole family was able to follow him into this boat, into this ark, where they were saved through the destruction that was coming. See, one of the things that, that people sometimes think about is, does that mean if I give my life to Jesus, my whole family just automatically gets in to go to heaven? Well, no, that's not the case. Every single one of us have a decision that we need to make with God on our own individually. But you can't discount the importance of this moment that you can make a difference in your family by you being faithful, by you showing up, by you coming to church every Sunday, by you bringing your kids, by you living the things that, that God has intended for you to, to live. You can make a huge difference in the people around you. You can make a difference in your children, even though maybe some of them have not following God and maybe they're far from God right now. You can make a difference even if your family, the, the ones that you're crazy when you see at the holidays and you kind of avoid them for most other times of the year, but you can still make a difference in these people by just being faithful and modeling the things that God has for you. You can make a difference in those things. I want to encourage you today that if you're praying for some people that are maybe in your family, that they would come to know the God that you know. Come Come to know Jesus like you know, that you by being faithful, by you by showing up every week, by you doing the things that you know God has called you to do, you can make a huge impact in their life without you even realizing it. 
I heard a story of a family in our church who had been coming for a long time, the, the, the mom and the dad, and their kids were a little bit older, and, and they were just praying that, that their kids would come to know the same God that they know. Their kids kind of didn't want to go to church too much and were kind of kind of far from God a little bit, and they were just praying that their kids would find church and find a church. It didn't have to be this church, but they kept showing up, and they kept praying. They kept asking God, God, you know, I want to see my kids fall in love with you. And they just kept showing up. They started serving on our dream team here, being here almost every week, just being faithful. And one by one, their kids began to come in to the church, come into this place, find God, rededicate their life to Jesus. And now they're serving too as well. It's amazing to see that you, by just showing up and being faithful, you can make one of the greatest impacts right there in your own family. Number two, I think we can learn from Noah's life is that you can make a difference in your generation. You can make a huge difference in the generation that you're in right now. Especially some of our college students that are in this place today, I love you guys. And don't let anybody tell you that you can't make a difference. Don't let anybody tell you that by you holding true to the things of God and, and keeping God's word truth in your life and, and holding true to those things, don't let anybody tell you that you can't make a difference. Don't let anybody tell you that when you're at your workplace and you're surrounded by people who don't know God and are dropping F-bombs left and right and you're in the midst of maybe a toxic environment, don't let anybody tell you that you cannot make a difference in those people by being faithful and being true to the things of God and not, not letting go or not giving up and just staying true to the things that God has for you. Don't let anybody tell you you can't make a difference in this generation. I love this. One of my favorite stories in the New Testament is about a guy named Paul and a guy named Silas. And they were in prison because of their faith for Jesus Christ. And they were in prison and they got the snot beat out of them while they were in prison. Back then they had some crazy prisons and they beat them within an inch of their life. And they're sitting there at midnight, chained up, and they are worshiping and singing songs to Jesus in the middle of the night after they were just beat from within an inch of their life. And the Bible says that in the book of Acts, that an earthquake happened, and all of a sudden the, way, the walls of the jails fall, the chains on their wrists fall off, all the other prisoners, everybody's free. It's like, oh my goodness, our worship just literally did tear the walls down. This is awesome. And the jailer was so scared, he was so afraid that he turned the lights on and he's like, oh my goodness, all the prisoners are gonna escape. I'm just gonna kill myself because I know that I'm supposed to guard these people and now they're gonna, the, the Roman government's gonna kill me anyway. And Paul and Silas look at him and say, whoa, 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 don't do it. Don't kill yourself, don't do it. We're all still here, nobody's left, it's all good. And the, the Bible says that the jailer came and he fell down before Paul and Silas and he asked them a question. He said, what must I do to be saved? What must I do? Your God is different. You, you could have ran. You could have got out of here. You could have been out of here. You just left me for dead. But instead you stayed. There's something different about you guys. I just believe with all of my heart that when you are faithful to the things that God has for you, when you're following after him, there's gonna be people in your sphere of influence that are gonna look at you one day and say, there's just something different about you. There's just, what, what is it? I don't understand. Everybody else is cutting corners at work, why don't you? Everybody else is leaving early all the time, why don't you? Everybody else is dishonoring the boss, why don't you? You can say, listen, I, you know, hey, I'm not judging anybody, but I'm a follower of Jesus, and God's just done something different in my life. And, and, and they'll see the God inside, they'll see the light that is inside of you because you can make a difference in your generation. One person, one person can make a world of a difference in this world. So I think as we're kind of closing up this message this morning and, and Noah's running the left, he's probably breathing hard right now a little bit. You know, he's a little old. He's, we'll grace him. He, he, you know, he's probably got a long beard. I don't know. He's got his animal. Maybe he's riding a donkey. I don't know. But he's with us on this lap. And what I was thinking about, what would Noah's parting shots be? What would, before he goes back up in the stands and is cheering us on, what would, what would his words of encouragement be to you and I today? And so I kind of write some things down. If you're taking notes, I'd love for you to write these down too. And that is number one, don't be afraid to stand out. Don't be afraid to stand out. I think too many people are afraid to stand out in this world. And I just believe if you want to make a difference, you can't be afraid to be a little bit different at times. If you want to truly make a difference, you can't be afraid to stand out at moments of your life. Genesis 6, 14, real short little thing. It just says, so God told Noah, so go make yourself an ark. 
Here, go do it. Go do the thing that I've told you to do now. And so Noah goes out there and it does it. But here's the thing. It took Noah 120 years to build this ark. Talk about a building program. I mean, that's crazy. 120 years to build this ark. How, how, how hard must have that have been? How crazy, how many doubts must have came and crept into his mind? How many people came and, and looked at him and laughed and said, you're, you're crazy, what are you doing? Most biblical scholars believe that the earth had not even seen rain up until this moment. And so a lot of people are like, it's gonna rain? Okay, yeah, right, okay, sure buddy, you're out to lunch, cuckoo nest, you know. They're looking at him and saying, you're, you're just crazy. Let me just tell you that there's so many times in life that God will tell you to do something or speak to your heart to do something that may look crazy to the people around you, may not look normal to the culture around you, may be different to the people around you, but don't be afraid to stand out. I love what Proverbs 29 says, fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. One person can make a world of difference, but you can't be afraid to stand out. You can't be afraid to stand up for the things of God. The next thing, number two, if you're taking notes, what would Noah say to us? What would his words of encouragement be? I, I think, don't be afraid to be the first. Don't be afraid to be the first. I think one of the, 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 the comments that irritates me the most, maybe it's just my temperament, is when people say, well, we've never done that before. I don't know, we can do that. It's never, we've never done that before. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And my response to those people always is, so? <laughs> so what, we've never done it before. It doesn't mean it can't be done. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. You know, it's, it's all good, don't, it's not a big deal. We can go after these things and we can do it. Sometimes when you're following God and following the destiny that he has for you, sometimes it's meaning stepping out and doing something that you've never done before. Stepping out and doing something that you've never even thought about doing before. But every time that you do and you step out, God is always faithful to meet you right where you're at. That's why it's called a step of faith. When you walk out and you begin to say, okay, God, I believe you're calling me to do this. Your word says this. I'm going to trust you at that. It, it, you, God, you, God meets you right where you're at. I love what Hebrews 11:7 7 says, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. He's, things that were not yet seen. I want to encourage you, don't be afraid to be the first. You can make a world of a difference, but don't be afraid to be the first. And I want to kind of say something today because as I was preparing this part of the message, I felt like God really kind of paused me and stopped me and said, I want, you to, I want you to take a moment right here. And I want to encourage some people in this place today that you have the ability to be a difference maker, but you got to go first. And what I mean by that is I'm going to say a few things today that I believe is going to speak to some of you in this room about going first. And you'll, you'll get what I'm talking about. I think that for some of you in this place, don't be afraid to take the risk. Some, that's for somebody in this room today. Don't be afraid to take the risk. Go for it. Be the first to apologize now. Like, you do it. Don't wait. Be the first to ask for forgiveness. Don't sit there and, and wait for that other person to do it. You be the first. You're gonna make a world of a difference. Don't quit. Some of you felt like God was speaking to me and it just said some people are on the verge of quitting certain things in their life. And uh, I just wanna encourage you in this moment, don't quit. Don't quit. Step up right now. Dig deep. Get the help you need. Like if, if, there, if there's some, a place in your life you need some help, get the help you need. Don't, don't wait, don't put it off. Get the help you need. This one was just very evident when I was praying, but. Don't wait for the phone call. You make the phone call. So I don't know who that's for today, but don't wait for the phone call. You make the call. You pick up the phone. You be the first and you do it. And I thought this was the last one. I felt like God spoke to me. It was, it was start today, not tomorrow. Like for somebody in this room today, there's something that God's been kind of put inside your heart to do or to stop doing and to get freedom from. And it's really easy to say, I'll do it tomorrow. But I wanted to say to somebody in this room today, do it today. Like don't, don't put it off for tomorrow. Like when you get home from church today, 
do the thing that God's placed inside you to do. Because one person can make a world of difference. One person can make a world of difference. And the last thing I think that, I think Noah would say to us, number three, is remember God's promise to you. Remember God's promise to you. All throughout his word, like this is God's like love story to you and me. And all throughout it are promises that he said that he would do for you and for me. And these giants of faith. Sometimes when you go through life, you have to remember those promises. You have to remember what God said in the midst of the difficult seasons. You have to remember them. I love what, what Genesis 9, 13 says. He says, listen, he goes, I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant. Not a sign of judgment, not a sign of anger, not a sign of vengeance. He says, no, no, it's a sign of a covenant between me and the earth between me and the earth. There are so many promises in God's word that I want you to remember. Like, like I will be with you always, Jesus said, even to the very end. I'll be with you. You're not doing this alone. You're not on the job alone. You're not going through that difficult season alone. He says, no, I'll be with you to the very, very end. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He goes, don't think you're alone. You may think you're walking down that path alone, but you're not. I'm right there with you. You may think you're going through the season alone, but you're not. I'm carrying you right now. You just can't even tell. He goes, you may think you're going through that, but he goes, I'm with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And I love this one. He says, listen, he goes, there is nothing, nothing that you could ever do that would separate you from the love that is in Christ Jesus. There's nothing you can do. He goes, man, my love is complete for you right now. You may have messed up yesterday. You may mess up tomorrow. But guess what? God's love for you and for me is complete right now. And there's nothing you can do or nothing to make God love you any more. And there's nothing you can do to make God love you any less than he does right now. It's so good. She got it. Come on. But you got to remember those promises because it's so easy to grow weary in this life. It's so easy to get tied down in this life. But God wants to encourage you today by looking at an old man by, by, by name Noah who built an ark, but got some animals together and saved humanity. But listen, he's saying, listen, you can make a world of a difference. You can make a world of a difference. You gotta keep persevering. You can't give up. You gotta trust God. Remember his promises. He is who he says he is. He will be faithful for you, just like he was faithful for these giants of the faith. Let's stand up today. We're gonna close in this place.